I'm Nicole Kasperson, fintech journalist, and this is What the Fintech. As a journalist who has covered the finance sector over the last five years, I've had the opportunity to interview and engage with some of the best minds in the space. The media landscape is changing, and financial services is grabbing the attention of a more diversified audience than ever before. As a member of that growing demographic, I will provide direct access to the inner workings of a complex industry while bringing in an unconventional perspective to news coverage. Leaving big bank earning reports to the boring traditional media firms, I'll focus on the tech-savvy apps, digital investing platforms, challenger banks, and payment giants to drive relevant content that looks forward to disruption instead of fearing it. Kristen, welcome to What the Fintech. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no problem. And so excited to have you here to start. Where are you working from today? Uh, right now, I'm in my living room. Uh, I'm in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, we, we work from the office three days a week, but Wednesday's a work from home day. So I'm at home right now. All right. Do you have any uh, incentives for your uh, employees for working from home? Or working in the office, I mean, actually. <laughs> yeah. So we, we've taken actually a pretty, uh, what I think is a nice blended approach. And that like, obviously remote work is a big draw for a lot of people and the flexibility and autonomy it provides. But we also find that a lot of people are looking for office time. And it's really hard to find that balance. People want time with their, their coworkers. They want time to solve problems together. They want time to be able to like tackle the big things that need to just like sit in a room. So we do an office three days a week in Midtown, uh, sorry, in Union Square. I'm in Midtown. Um, and what we're doing to try and make sure that remote element still stays really important for people is that we're doing a remote month. So for the month of April and the month of December, we're yeah. giving people full remote for those months so that they can say, you know what? I want to work from Portugal. I want to work from Singapore. I want to work from Mexico. And they can take that time and get that travel in. But there were still sort of central, like based here in New York so that we all know that like this is the place where we want to solve problems together. All right. That's got to be the best answer I've had to that question so far. I throw it in there because like for the most part, my guests are, are working from their living room or their office space in their home. And so I just love that we get a, a peek of that, um, but love the hybrid style. That is very, very cool. Good months to pick too, right? Like December and April, uh, cold as hell and then rainy and not fun. So good yeah, times. Go somewhere warm. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Go somewhere warm. <laughs> and I know I'm missing that right now being in New York myself. I am in BK. Um, but yes, yeah, so I wanted to start off by first talking a little bit about you, obviously, and your values, starting with a very viral tweet where you shared with followers a picture of yourself pregnant on the phone negotiating millions of dollars with a caption saying, this is what a VC back CEO looks like. So why was this so important to you to share? I wish I could say it was totally strategic and that I had like planned it out as this big moment. But uh, I think like a lot of viral tweets, it was a little bit off the cuff. Um, I had not washed my hair that day. Uh, we, were, we were actually living in this place called Launch House. So it was like this house of founders in L.A., and I was on the phone with our potential Series A lead investors. And my co-founder, who's also my partner, took a photo of me just on the phone, right? And he sent it to me, just was like, hey, this is cool. I was like, you know what? People should see this. And, you know, I, I'm from Reno. My parents didn't go to college. Like, I have broken into tech from basically just like a, an inability to be stopped. <laughs> I was not really raised in this world. I was not taught to be in this world. And I think it was really important to me to share that, a venture-backed CEO is not just a 25-year-old dude in a garage in Silicon Valley. And that's a fine thing to be, but that there's this whole range of different things that founders can look like, that VC-backed founders can look like, that like successful business owners, CEOs, and like people who are having a meaningful impact on the, the story of our lives can look unexpected, I guess. Like I said, didn't wash my hair that day. It was like really not planned at all. I was just standing, my arms behind my back in a weird <laughs> way, but you know, my feet hurt. It's a classic, like, you know, it's the, the modern take on barefoot and pregnant it was sort of in flip-flops and pregnant on the phone with a bunch of VCs. And I think it was really important to just show that, that, uh, that story isn't often told. Yeah. And it's really important that people know that there isn't one right way to lead a VC backed company. Oh, I love that. It's exactly the reason I even started with the fintech and what I'm doing, because I do think 
Um, obviously women's stories and what that looks like in many different industries isn't always told. Um, frankly, it's the increase of the of women as subject matters in news stories has been um, pretty dismal, 25%, uh, according to the UN. And that is um, what it was in 2020. In 1995, it was 17%. So oh. that, I know, that oh. stat, I love oh. that I got an authentic uh, reaction to that stat because I, I have been like mulling it over for a while. And um, yeah, it's just like crazy. So Way to kudos to you for like sharing that being vulnerable, right? Um, that's something I'm trying to learn myself with this show. Um, but like thousands of comments, likes, things that I'm sure I'm sure you had positive and negative. Um, you know, how has that experience maybe just shaped you as a fintech leader today? Yeah, uh, if you have never gone viral. Uh, oh. It's not an experience I would really wish on anyone. Wow. <laughs> Strangely enough, I, I I think that in general, um, it's it's not comfortable. Um, and I think you know, obviously, the the tiniest sliver of a view into fame is uh, I think eye opening <laughs> as someone who who doesn't come from that world. And um, you know, people will make judgments about you and your body and your values and your, and, and everything about you based off of a single photo and a single tweet. And, um, it was an opportunity to really see how one, I think in the midst of a pandemic, how weak mental health is overall and how people are really struggling for a place to like get their feelings out, to share their opinions, to like find, um, a community of people who believe what they believe um, and so I think that was, that was really tough in terms of how that shaped my values and what's important to me. I think it showed the, the thing that you always believe in the back of your head, which is that like, you can't judge someone from like a, a one second meeting. Um, mm-hmm. I think that, that really gets reinforced for you. Um, and I personally took away from it that there was nothing that I could look from the outside in on and have a completely informed judgment on and the importance of that. And I, I love Twitter. I think it's given me a huge amount of value in the business. It's like, I've made a lot of friends. I, I feel yeah. like it's a really powerful tool. Um, but I also feel like it's important to recognize like how to separate yourself from some of those things. And I think especially as a like fast scaling founder, who's starting to get some attention from people that maybe don't know me, um, that the opportunity is to create you know, Kristen, the fintech founder and CEO, and Kristen, like the the mom <laughs> and mm. the partner, and all of those sorts of things. And I, I, uh, it was a very sharp moment of relief <laughs> of like point to that straight on and be like, oh, okay, I have to separate these two identities and recognize that they're not, um, their worth is not tied together, and one is something that other people think, and one is what I think about myself. Mm-hmm. Oh, what profound lessons learned, uh, you <laughs> from a tweet. <laughs> From a tweet, from going viral, right? I mean, people, they like, they work so hard to even have that moment. And I mean, I definitely resonate with the tweets that I never think are going to amount to anything are always the ones that I get all these likes and and things on. And I'm just, and then the the thread that I work very hard on for like an hour, it's like, no one cares Um, (laughs) all the time. But um, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I love that you took so much out of it and that, you had just, yeah, you, and you're applying it today, right? Because those are, those are meaningful moments and, um, that just, they shape you. Right. And I imagine that after experiencing something like that, especially on like kind of the precipice of founding your company and, um, you know, being in like a, a launch house with filled with other startup founders, um, you kind of made, like, did it make you look, kind of look back at what you were building and say like, okay, maybe I need to do, things a certain way, I guess, right? To make sure, like you mentioned, like mental health, right? To make sure everyone uh, is nurtured, especially myself, right? Yeah. And and I think, again, it's like being able to separate your identity and being able to say that, um, you know, my executive coach who I've worked with closely on a lot of these things, right? But being able to like understand that the way that people who work for me perceive me versus the way that people on the internet perceive me versus the way that our customers perceive me, all those things are different and they're all okay. And none of them necessarily need to shake my foundational understanding of myself. So I I know we're going to turn this into a self-help podcast here, but I think that was a, that was a really important thing for me to learn, especially like 
while you're pregnant. If you've ever, if, if anyone listening has ever been pregnant, like your body doesn't look like itself. And so it's a really weird time to have other people like pushing opinions upon you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Well, I, I will, I will, uh, move forward in, uh, pressing you on this, uh, on this story, but it's just so interesting, but I do want to also tap into your, uh, background. Uh, your background is in economics and mathematics. And, um, I mean, you also kind of mentioned earlier and it stood out to me that, you know, you got into this industry largely just by, you know, driving force, just by like pushing yourself forward, perseverance, Um, so how has maybe all of that served as a benefit to you as a startup founder? Uh, so I double majored in mathematics and economics. People often think that economics is the one that leads, leads in importance in terms of what I do now. (laughs) Uh, I think the interesting thing is that math and the abstract problem solving of like writing sort of theoretical proofs feels much more relevant to what I do day by day, which is probably surprising to most people, but, um, those backgrounds were important as an educational foundation, creating structure, finding meaning, being able to list assumptions, right? All of those things have made an impact on my ability to lead. Um, I think how they combined with the fact that, you know, I'm a, a blue collar kid from Reno, Nevada, whose parents didn't go to college. Um, I think it really influenced the way that I like see opportunity and the world as like anything is possible. And again, I think a lot, a lot of people will tell this story maybe from the perspective of an immigrant coming to this country and seeing like that anything can happen. I feel like I very much have that story as like, you know, my, my parents didn't go to college. My dad was in a union. My mom stayed at home for a long time and then was a part-time office manager. And all of that just went to show that like education, grit, perseverance can lead anyone anywhere. And being able to like accept the opportunity that comes your way is an important part of like establishing how you lead others. And I think as people have joined my team, I've really tried to give people that same opportunity and recognize that like potential is evenly distributed and, and giving people that chance to like build what it is that they believe can be in the world. And it's, it's not always easy (laughs) for sure. Uh, But that that's the, that's the opportunity that sits in front of each of us. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, and I love that you can connect that to a lot of my guests have a common thread of um, either being immigrants themselves that came here and, you know, obviously fought tooth and nail to, to get into, um, you know, fintech either found founders roles or even CEOs, um, or their parents were, and they kind of watched that struggle. So it's like interesting to think just even, you know, economic diversity, right? Um, it's, it's so important to, um, diversity is just so much more than just, uh, you know, gender or the way you look. Um, it can be like your experiences, your background, what you go through. Um, so I love that you shared that. So thank you. Um, when it comes to kind of the gap that you saw in the fintech space, will you just maybe talk to us a little bit about your aha moment when you were like, I should build catch. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, as with most startup stories, it's, it's a, it's a blend of a lot of things coming together at the right time. Um, my co-founder was a freelance designer and engineer, so he really lived this problem firsthand of, of why is this so hard? Uh, there are solutions out there that take care of this for people who are in um, more traditional employment. So he had worked at Google, he had worked at, at Microsoft and found that like they have this HR management system that gives you like takes care of your taxes, does your retirement, gives you benefits, and all of it is super streamlined, easy to use. And when he was on his own, your income comes in in a fluctuating way and sort of the things that you need to take care of are completely on you. And there's really no tool that helps you do that. So he really lived that problem firsthand. I think my approach was much more of the, my dad was in a union. Benefits were a core part of how our family found stability and success and like why I was able to go to college when my parents didn't necessarily have the education credentials, right? So I saw benefits as something that like really unlocked opportunity for a lot of the middle class. A lot of people will look at, you know, 20th century was technological advancement. I actually see the 20th century as like the time when benefits reigned, right? Pensions and, Mm -hmm. you know, health insurance and all of the things that employers were providing to their employees, which made a huge amount of sense because people would start at a company right after college and stay until they were 65. And so companies took this really paternalistic role towards providing these really critical financial products. And in the last 30 years, a lot has changed, right? The way we work has changed. The way companies sort of work with employees has changed. Average tenure, I mean, I don't even want to 
the last two years have been totally outside of the norm, right? But <laughs> even before that, right, employers were looking at average tenure and seeing it go down and down and down. And so the benefits packages that were provided were looking significantly different. And the problem was that infrastructure of providing a stable future with a retirement, health insurance to protect against emergency, all of those things just like didn't keep up. And they were built for this world that doesn't really exist. So the aha moment was really saying the next 50 to 75 years are going to look fundamentally different than the last 50 to 75 years. And we need to be able to provide financial infrastructure, again, long-term planning and wealth building, protecting against emergency and insurance, particularly in the health space, and saying we need to bring those products into the way that people work now. And that was the big realization for Catch. Whew. Wow. A realization that you might just need an economics and mathematics degree for. Uh, Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. But I mean, and just, but really, really thorough and, and, um, but also with that mix of that personal experience, right? Um, And so given what you have built here, I do imagine that there is kind of um, the, a, a perfect balance maybe, or like a blueprint for incorporating like behavioral economics into building a fintech product. And I definitely want to maybe pick your brain a little bit on that. Yeah. I mean, behavioral economics, uh, was not, was not particularly prevalent when I was studying. I guess that ages myself just a little bit, but you know, back then, way back when, uh, the model was that human beings are completely rational right? And that they will make decisions based on rational models and trade-offs and all those sorts of things. Now, for any of us who have actually lived here in the world, we know (laughs) that that's not really how humans operate. And there are all sorts of examples of how people will make decisions that seem to not make sense, but that you can kind of intuitively understand, right? And the best example sort of where a lot of that behavioral economics came from was this idea of like, would you rather have a guaranteed $25,000 right now or a one in four shot at $100,000? Now, traditional economics says that like those things are exactly the same to you and that like you don't care. But if I were to actually sit in front of you and say, I have $25,000 right now that you can take, you would probably prefer that, right? Mm-hmm. And so there's this like element of like, oh, guarantees are nice, right? And behavioral economics built out a lot of these heuristics around people have these preferences that are maybe a little bit unstated and not totally rational, but they're fairly intuitive. And I think building a product like Catch was really saying like, we have to leverage an understanding of how people actually think and operate to be able to serve them with these really important needs, right? We don't have the sort of controlled distribution that employer-led pensions and benefits does. So we have to serve people in a world in which their actions are understood in the context of their humanity. Mm -hmm. And given all of that, could you just give us like a quick update on where Catch is at today? You know, if you're able to share users or just figures or, you know, what's, what's happening now? Yeah. So we have built a personal payroll and benefits product for individual freelancers and contractors. So we serve people, not businesses, <laughs> right? People who are earning income in a fragmented way. Um, we provide personal payroll to tens of thousands of freelancers right now, automatic setting aside for taxes, paying the IRS quarterly, taking care of all that without people having to get involved in it. Um, on the health insurance side, we are directly integrated with the marketplace in 34 states. Um, That gives us an ability to enroll people directly in health insurance and get them all the tax credits that they're qualified for. So we launched uh, in 2018. Since then, we've built out those health insurance integrations. We've built out that payroll and that automation process. We've been able to scale it really rapidly, really in the last 12 months. Wow. I mean, I imagine so given just the, uh, uh, the influx of more people either becoming Content creators, hello myself. Um, <laughs> granted, I have an employer, but um, most of us don't, though. For right? now, most, for <laughs> no, uh, uh, don't Dang. listen. Um, but anyways, uh, <laughs> don't listen. Um, but yes, the but really, like most of them don't, though, right? Most content creators, um, hairstylists, right, artists, um, they don't actually like have right that um, that stability of knowing that you have an employer that is taking on like you said earlier, right? Those like almost parental um, roles of your finances and the most important aspects of it sometimes, right? Healthcare, like 401k, um, all of these things that go into your actual like financial future. Um, so, I mean, when when someone kind of comes in or like a, a user, right, kind of comes in for the most part, how is, I guess, typically 
how are you kind of feeling out like their financial literacy as independent workers and kind of tying in how you need to ensure that, you know, you can kind of make sure they know how to almost manage their own financial freedom too, despite the fact that they have your like help with automating that type of thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Financial literacy is a really really important topic. And I think uh, the behavioral economics stuff you asked about earlier comes into play in a really strong way. Um, Personally, hate the phrase financial literacy. I think it is, uh, first of all, because the data says it doesn't work, right? Like (laughs) across the board, like educational interventions are not the things that like change people's behavior. (laughs) Like if you sit someone down for a Saturday workshop for eight hours and say, here's what retirement is. This is dollar cost averaging. This is Mm. what portfolios look like the end outcome is not them actually being any more prepared for retirement. So the way that I often think about that and the way that we've sort of framed it with catch is financial capability building, Mm -hmm. which is looking for opportunities to build the capability to do the things that they need to financially. And it's based on action. It's based on action, not learning. Like this isn't a test. I think the the best comparison that we often give is like, um, this might make me sound a little unsophisticated. I have no idea how Wi-Fi works. Like, (laughs) How does internet move through the air? Like, I, I don't know. The <laughs> none of us really know. None of us really know. And yet we're all able to use it and succeed. And we can use an iPhone and we can use our cell phones and we can access the internet wirelessly and we can do all these things with it without understanding it in depth. And the idea that in financial services, someone has to become an expert at the financial service itself is an indication to me that the industry has not done a very good job in making their products user-friendly, making them accessible, making them things that like are fitting in with people's lives. So the way we think about it on the platform as our users come in is where are the opportunities to give them sort of micro amounts of information with which to make decisions. So the really important part of Catch was that like Catch is not about being a, a blog, right? Like content is super important. It's really helpful right. to like give people that opportunity. But at the end of the day, you have to like do the stuff. Like reading about a retirement account all day long is not going to actually help you as much as someone being like, I just opened your retirement account. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just opened it. It exists and it's real, right? So in terms of how our product onboarding works, we find those moments to say like, you need to make a decision between a traditional and a Roth IRA. A Roth IRA. We mm-hmm. start by having a point of view. If you're independent, right, making sure that you are not putting money into a place where you're going to be penalized if you withdraw, like your income might have more variability. And so you might need to withdraw more than someone else does, right? So here's why we recommend this product. Now, which one do you want, right? Like a small moment of education to then make a decision is very different than saying like, we've created this mass library of content and you can go and become an expert in these subjects and then come back and make a decision. And I think that's how a lot of the financial platforms, like the large sort of um, legacy players have built this massive infrastructure. Then they've tried to take it online and then they've created massive amounts of content when really it's about the, like the small give and take of here's a bit of information. Now make a decision. Here's a bit more information. Now make another decision. And that's how we approach the sort of umbrella term of financial literacy. Mm -hmm. Yes. And and you're not the first person that's told me that they didn't love that term. Um, Even like financial education is a little bit better, Um, but so true, right? Like who wants to take, they they don't teach it in school, which is a whole other thing and a problem. But like uh, as an adult, like, are you trying to go back to school if you're already working in that type of thing? Uh, No. So um, right, we would never, we would never like say that like, if iPhone came with like a huge manual of like, you have to like read this and learn this. And like, here's how you understand how to use your iPhone. We'd be like, this is a terrible product, right? <laughs> You'd be like, this is a bad product and it hasn't been made for users, right? And right. I think the financial industry sometimes like doesn't always hold itself to that same standard. Yeah. Okay. That's like, that is, that is like a revolutionary thought, right? She, you're like, I, I know it. I've been saying it. Um, you know, I started in fintech at a nonprofit. And, and a oh, lot of our work yeah. at the nonprofit was, a, was around that. How do you actually get people to like change what they do? And it's not setting them down and like teaching them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. helping them make decisions and making those decisions very easy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean that, and that's kind of what is supposed to make uh, maturing technology that we have today so exciting is that that's supposed to help make uh, the, the end user kind of make their own decisions, right? To be able right. to to actually say, oh, this is the next best action that I should take. And you're doing that incrementally, um, you know, through kind of the the 
the payroll for independence or benefits for independence. Right. And so, um, yeah, that's just so it's just so much smarter than, uh, you know, you if you want an iPhone, you have to you have to become a, a, a technology expert. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know how Wi-Fi works and I hope I never have. to. Learn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, I mean, when you so when you're kind of having these like uh, incremental moments, I mean, is there a place that you start? And then kind of measure, how do you kind of measure when someone is ready to go on to the next step? Yeah, um, definitely depends on the person. So there's, again, there's a huge amount of customization and what someone might need, what their situation is coming in. The reason why Catch exists for independence, first and foremost, is that they have a huge shared pain point, which is taxes. Mm -hmm. Um, we all have to pay taxes, right? Death and taxes, right? So we all have to pay taxes. And if you're working independently and you earn money from various different places on different schedules with sort of that sporadic income variability in size, like managing your taxes is a huge burden, right? Like you have to sit down once a month and be like, here's everything that came in. I got this much from Substack. I got this much from a freelance project I did. I got this much from like, oh, I also run this Etsy store on the side and I sold, you know, like, and those sorts of things make your income story very complicated. So our our typical way in is by saying your taxes are a pain and we can help with that. We can take this pain point off your plate by automating it, making it easy, saying anytime you get paid from any of those sources, we're going to take care of the taxes. We'll get it to the IRS. You don't have to think about anything. That gives us an opportunity to, one, we do that for free. So we build a ton of trust. We make sure people are like able to like get value out of our product, right? Lead with value. That's, That's the basic premise. And then say from there... There are these other more sophisticated products that you might need or might not, right? So you can use Catch. You can pay nothing for it. You can get that sort of automated tax withholding that pays your taxes every quarter and like not pay anything. That's fine. But our belief is that there are enough of these other products that need to be part of that story that we're able to build a really strong and enduring business by bringing together retirement and pulling that into the picture, right? You want that same automated experience so that every time those payments come in, you're also investing towards your IRA great. We can help with that, right? You need to be able to get health insurance. Like, great. We're a broker. We can enroll you in that. Like, those are the sorts of things that we can do to bring you from that journey of like huge pain point that you want solved right now, (laughs) all the way to like, you know, maybe you're not sure if you need health insurance or not, but we're building trust and we're building that education as you go. How smart to to start off with something, um, to start off with like the biggest probably headache, um, but one that you're right that literally every single person has to do, um, you know, like raise your hand if if uh, you may or may not still call your dad to help you with your taxes. Like it might be me. It's yeah. yeah. OK, <laughs> cool. And um, uh, admittedly, you don't know how Wi-Fi works and I need dad to help with my taxes. I'm lucky. Totally. Him. Um, but like well, imagine in a box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine there's still hope for Gen Z. They yes. can yeah. learn how to do taxes, at least if they're independent workers with catch. Right. Um yeah, that's really, really cool. And so when you, I guess I imagine when you like had that strategy to start with taxes, that, I mean, that's got to uh, tie in with the behavioral economics again, right? Like how, or behavioral finance and how someone thinks of managing their money or their wealth or their benefits to think, okay, taxes first and then everything else. Right. What's, what's the thing I'm going to get in trouble for? What's the, what's the pain, right? The IRS tells me I owe a five figure tax bill that I didn't think I owed. Like that is obviously going to be a priority over like, I'm going to retire 40 years from now. Right. So retirement's rarely the first priority that people come in with. Right. And that's okay. Right. Like you're trying to manage a, a complex lifestyle, a bunch of different things happening at once. But the goal is to make it easy, right? Like what is the way that we can make the default like easy to add that on? And how do we help set those baselines in a way that like we make recommendations that like help people set baselines that we think are beneficial for their overall financial well-being? Mm-hmm. And how is the how is like the the pricing, I guess, if you're able to kind of share if, uh, um, you know, if the, the tax portion is free. And then I imagine, right, obviously they have a great experience with that. And they're like, hell yeah, I don't use catch. Um, yeah. What, what is I, cause especially being an independent worker or gig economy worker, right. The things are very in flux. You don't have the stability of knowing, you know, every two weeks I'm getting this. Um, so what is like, how, how is like the pricing kind of laid out for you guys? 
uh, we make our money as brokers, right? Mm -hmm. So we make our money on health insurance. And that industry is designed in a way that helps brokers who help people find plans make their money from helping people enroll in those plans. So the cost out of pocket is nothing. Um, you don't have to pay to use catch. Now, if you get health insurance, you have to pay for your health insurance, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's part of the deal there, but we will get you all the tax credits that you qualify for to lower those premiums as much as possible. And then we earn money from the, the carriers, right? Oscar, Blue Cross, um, Friday health, right? They pay us to be able to sell those plans to you. So you don't have to pay. Now, the important thing to share about catch and that like, again, the sort of mission alignment that we have in everything we do is that our financial incentive system and sort of like how and where we make money is completely divorced from our product recommendation algorithm. So when we recommend a health plan to you, the system that recommends that has no idea what money we make off of it. Mm -hmm. So we'll recommend a plan to you, even if the commission is like the lowest one that we might ever receive, right? And we do that because we think it's really important, again, in the long term, like we're building trust, we're forming relationships. It's not about optimizing for that, like immediate, like, hey, you should pick this plan. It's about getting you in the thing that makes the most sense for you. And then like, let us let us worry about the business model on the back end. Mm -hmm. And what an important message, right, to, to send to folks, um, especially today. I, I feel like the... Um, Workers are very, they are struggling with trust in any capacity, uh, as we should be, right? Um, so to kind of have that transparent messaging is, it's so key. And it's something that in the past, financial services or fintech, anything in, in our realm hasn't been the best at. Yeah, I mean, and, and behavioral economics, <laughs> behavioral economics can be a force for good or it can be a force for mm -hmm. profit, which isn't always um second to good, but sometimes it can be that those principles are used to maximize profit in ways that people don't necessarily understand what they're paying, which is why our business model is one that's built around like, how do we make sure that the best thing that happens for you is the thing that makes us like the most successful as a company, right? So as you're building out your automated retirement, as you're building out your automated savings, like as your balances go up, that's good for catch, right? As your retirement goes up, that's good for catch. And so driving towards those sorts of things rather than sort of like sticking fees in places that you don't necessarily recommend or recognize them, like that's that's really what we're after. <laughs> right? Like, hello, fintech, that was not the assignment. Putting right. random fees in little places where no one sees that's that we were supposed to leave that to the finance, like the the bank, the right. big banks, and the what financial. if we made it feel like a casino? It's like, <laughs> why are we doing this? Um, so, thank you, thank you so much for building something that does not do that. Uh, right. <laughs> you you understood fintech's assignment. Um, so, one thing yeah. I want to ask also is about kind of the um, and I touched on it a little earlier, but the I imagine maybe there's some influx of users that have come in. Is how have you been maybe managing that? given the pandemic and more, you know, independent gig workers, creators? Yeah. I mean, it is a wild time right now. I think the data came in that 47 million people quit their jobs voluntarily in 2021. Um, and if you're wondering what that looks like as a total percent, there are only 160 million people in the workforce in America. So we're talking about 30%. Um, voluntarily left their jobs in 2021. And a lot of those people went to be independent right? They went to try their own thing. They went to pull together different things that they wanted to do. Again, let's, let's run an e-commerce shop. Let me like, you know, let me do a little bit of consulting. Let me do a little bit of gig platform work. You know, if I want to deliver a couple meals, I'll do that. Um, and so what that's meant for catch is that people are coming to independent work for the first time. Um, and that is like an elevated level of responsibility on the education front and like the helping people understand what their obligations are and what it is that they need to do in order to be successful. And our belief is that like there really is no one right way to work or not right way to work. Like being a full time W2 employee is great. Being someone who pulls together 19 different income sources and makes your money sort of piece by piece. That's great, too. The important thing to understand is that we're bringing people through that journey with the ability to say, like, here's how you need to stay on top of your obligations. Here's how you build a financial safety net while you're doing all that stuff. So get back to earning on all those 19 different sources. Like, that's great. Like, do whatever it is that you need to do, but make sure that you have the systems in place so that you're not going to get stuck at tax day or you're not going to get stuck in several years without savings or you're not going to have a retirement account or you might be injured and not have health insurance. So we want to make sure that as people are entering independent work, they're thinking through what the implications are and then putting in place a system to make sure they're successful when they do it. I love it. 
And how has been how has it been navigating uh, and scaling a fast growing fintech like Catch while keeping this culture and values intact? I feel like when companies kind of get to a point where they're getting you know almost too big, they lose it somewhere along the way almost. Um, it's a challenge. I mean, it, it's definitely a challenge, especially in the last two years with all of the things that are going on in the workforce in general. But I think the the unifying principles that bring people at Catch together, first, it's our mission, right? Like who we're trying to help and like what we're trying to build is something that we all believe is inevitable and we want to be the ones to make it happen, right? So that unifying mission is a huge part of how we keep our culture unified. The second pieces are really like it's less about experience and more about like psychographics. And I think that's been a really important lesson for us is like finding people who have resilience and a growth mindset and the ability to tackle ambiguous problems and like a confidence in like, I will be able to figure this out. Like that has been something that has like really held us together through working remote and then not remote. And then we moved headquarters, right? We moved our headquarters in the last 12 months. And so all of the, all of those things have led to a lot of like differences day to day. And when you find people who are really like thriving in that environment, they're the ones who are like, I can handle anything. Ambiguity doesn't scare me. I have the grit and resilience mm-hmm. that it takes to be able to build something in a world where like there is no competitor, right? We're category creators right now. There is not like a, oh, catch is the second version of why, right? Mm-hmm. There will be others who come, but we're the ones who are really pushing that first path forwards. And so the people on our team really have to like be bought into that idea that like we're creating the templates. We're not trying to like fill in someone else's. Wow, such a powerful message. I mean, and right, I would, I, I feel like if uh, I was trying to work for a fintech startup, right, that's something that I would want to run to. Uh, is is we like we are hiring every <laughs> team all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know. Maybe one day I'll be an operator. I don't know. Who knows? Um, been a reporter this whole time, but we'll see. <laughs> and, um, uh, you need lots of content. <laughs> uh, your, pl- your employers are going to be so mad at me. No, I but we, truly, for anyone who's listening, we need lots of content. <laughs> we need lots of engineers. We need lots of product designers. We need lots of those things because this problem is huge. So this, yeah. this is this is not about you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is about the greater good. Okay. Exactly. So, <laughs> I mean, it's true. Um, so what are your tips for other fintech founders out there working to also create like create mission-driven products that help people that aren't typically served by traditional financial institutions? Yeah. Uh, the first thing is to understand who you're trying to serve and what type of business you're trying to run. Uh, like I said, I actually started in fintech at a nonprofit. Nonprofits are critically important to serving the most vulnerable folks, and they have a really important role to play in financial services. They're very different than venture-backed companies. And so I think the first thing is sometimes people kind of muddy those lines and try and say, well, I'm trying to do good, so let me raise venture money in order to be able to do more good. Um, Nonprofits are great. Uh, There's no reason why it's not something you should do. But first, if you're trying to approach the, the problem as something that is for social good, maybe a different business model is better for you, right? Mm -hmm. If you're trying to build a large venture-backed business and you want to have a mission component to what you do, you want to serve an audience who's underserved, you have a couple choices. You can choose to say, I've found this opportunity in the market and I'm going to make a ton of money off of it. That's great. Lots of financial services companies do that. Mm -hmm. Um, We've taken a little bit of a different path, which is to say like, this is a problem we want to solve for people. Now, how do we make that a business model that makes sense in a venture-backed world? And saying that let's align our business imperative and our financial success with the financial success of our customers, right? So very different than like a payday lender is saying like, people need this, we'll provide it and make a ton of money off of it, right? For us, we're saying like, people need this, how do we align our financial outcomes with things that our customers will benefit from as well? And so it's it's definitely a longer path. <laughs> it's like it's a 
more, it's more work to get there, but we believe it creates a, a company that in the long run will be much more enduring and much more stable and align with the way that more people want to work, right? We'll be able to attract top talent. We'll be able to build trust with our customers. And that trust with our customers is ultimately the thing that's going to make us successful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, and it's a, it's a big North star of what I, of my podcast and what the FinTech and my newsletter is to cover uh, the fintech companies that are doing that and and kind of uplift that that story because I mean yeah sure there's people out there that maybe aren't so into it okay yeah. uh, build your successful company however you want I guess but um, yeah I love focusing on this because to me it's the reason why fintech is here it's why we're um, we're all here right it's part of the reason why it's considered you know an alternative or just uh, some something to actually kind of help more people have that access to financial you know stability that we all want to see um, or at least I think most of us want to see um, right. yeah in the world so yeah. one of my final questions for you I do love asking a little bit about just kind of um, some of your own tips around kind of keeping your mental health in check. And obviously being a female, I know I, people actually really love this. Uh, yes. People, <laughs> This is also a lifestyle podcast and fintech yeah. and yeah. Um, viral tweet lessons learned. Uh, but being a female CEO in a male dominated field does come with a unique set of challenges. So yes, what are some of your ways of just getting past feeling isolated or imposter syndrome or just anything that you do to help with that, that mental health. I know I struggle with this sometimes too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and again, especially given everything that's gone on in the world in the last couple of years, it's, it's been a hard time to, to make space for that. I think, um, a lot of these are probably things that people already know, which is that finding ways to sort of identify yourself outside of your work is Mm -hmm. really important. Um, and whether that's through hobbies or, um, goals or other side projects or relationships that you have or being a parent or any of those things, like that's a really important way to sort of distance yourself. And I think a lot of founders really struggle with distancing themselves for obvious reasons, right? Like we're incredibly passionate about what we do. We want to spend all of our time solving this problem. And we're here because we can't sleep until the problem is solved, right? So I think that is a difficult first step, but it's probably one that other people talk about a lot in terms of the lens of like, being a, a female founder and CEO in this industry, I think one thing I've found um, that is maybe a little unexpected is that sometimes um, <laughs> identifying as a female founder and CEO is more isolating um, than not. And what I found is that I often form some of my deepest and most important relationships with people who are a different gender, but who came from that same shared experience of not having enough, having a big chip on their shoulder, like building something that they believe like is important and meaningful and being willing to take the hits day after day after day. And I have way more in common with those people than someone who, you know, has a totally different background than me, which again, not good or bad, but just very different of someone who sort of went through the the traditional path of getting to venture backing of, you know, Ivy League school, working at a FANG, you know, following these paths, like that's great, but sometimes I find that I've I've felt I've often felt my most isolated when someone's like, "You're you and this person are the same gender, therefore you identify." And yeah. I meet these women who are incredibly impressive and are going to be successful, and I'm like, "Oh my gosh, that woman is like she like that's so great." And I believe in that like champion circle of like supporting other underrepresented groups. But sometimes, like for me, my mental health comes much more from being like, "Who has the same?" St- story that I have and who has felt the same pain that I have. And and the sort of the funniest example is that um, I have never found fundraising to be particularly easy, right? I've just never found it easy. I have found it to be difficult. Every time I've done it, we've raised $20 million. And every time I fundraise, it's hard, right? And I spoke to a woman who is impressive, right? I mean, this woman has a resume where I'm like, if I had millions of dollars, I would give you this money, right? Like you are going to succeed. And, and we had been introduced as sort of this, like you're a shared cohort. And I think it was, um, it was an interesting experience for me because I was like, you're going to be successful. You're amazing. 
And at the same time, I feel like when I said, oh, fundraising is so hard, right? And she's like, what are you talking about, right? Like in the most genuine and like lovely way. But I, I ended up feeling like it was more important for me to, to like build my mental health around the network of people who like are overcoming the same challenges I do. And that sometimes like particularly because there aren't that many female fintech founders, that working with the people who have those same stories has been the place where I have found my energy and my excitement. And like, whatever I can do to champion people who are underrepresented, like I will do that and I need to do that. But like some of these women are like, they're coming from earlier than me and they're going to blow past me in four minutes. And like, <laughs> let me just like make way for them. And that's, that's the best I can do. <laughs> I, I, well, and I, I love your, your honest and authentic answer and one that I have not heard before because it's, um, yeah, just because it's so truly you, right. And unique to, to yourself. Um, but for me, it's, I, when you're saying that, I do think about how, you know, I, even when I was developing, uh, the concept of the show and what the FinTech um, obviously, you know, elevating for me, it was all about elevating, um, diverse voices, whether that be gender, skin color, um, you know, background, um, where you come from. Uh, and that's why, you know, I think sometimes on the surface, it can seem like I only am wanting like women to join as my guests or, you know, something like that. I'm only women focused or I'm only this. And it's like, no, 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 no. I want like this to be a, I want this to be a community of people that have felt, um, like left out of whatever traditional world, right. Or the way the traditional world was built Mm -hmm. and who have not seen themselves yet represented in this industry. And I want them to see a collection of so many different amazing founders and investors and CEOs and people in, in fintech roles that they never thought like, oh, wow, that person has dyslexia like me. Like, that's not something you see on the outside. Wow. They're the CEO of a freaking fintech company. I can do that. Or like, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, that was like, that's what resonated with me with your answer was like, I I want it to, it, it's, it feels more communal when we are thinking about our shared experiences and not just like, placing us in certain boxes because demographic lines. Exactly. 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 Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. We got, we got it. We got each other. <laughs> this is awesome. Wonderful. And it's not that those things don't matter. And it's not yes, that we of course. find ways to make space for bringing those numbers up, right? Like 2% of venture dollars go to, to female founders, right? Like that exactly. we need to do things to bring those numbers up. But I think that like in, in terms of the mental health part of the question, it was really it was really enlightening to me when I would like sit down and be like, ah, female founder. And then I was like, wow, this woman is so awesome. <laughs> like, it's not me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think that it's really important that we don't solely identify with someone because of a demographic line and more of like, who's telling my story, whatever, whatever they might look like, however they might approach the, the situation. And I found that like, there are so many people in this world, in fintech in general, who are here because they recognize the importance that like, financial services have in people's lives. This sounds really nerdy and lame. I'm already like hearing myself say it. But like, like they recognize that like financial services can change the trajectory of someone's life, right? Mm-hmm. And like the way that they can access their money and like how easy it is to access their money and like just like a little bit of a chance here and there. And there are so many of us who approach it with like that sort of a background and like that that mentality. And I think that like being able to call that out and like make space Space for whatever that that uh, that conversation ends up being, regardless of what you know what boxes we check. And I think sometimes those things are like so well intentioned and they're mm-hmm. so important. But like I've definitely felt like in filling certain things out where they're like, "Are you a female founder? Check this box." And I'm like, "Ooh, I hate this. I just hate it so yeah. much because I just I just want to be a successful founder and find people who see the world the way I do, regardless of whatever else." Might be mm-hmm. true. For them. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, a super strong note um, to almost end on. I do have to ask you my final question, though. Uh, that wasn't it. It it actually is to tell us. Please tell us what the f we can expect from you and catch next. Uh, short answer is incredible growth <laughs> and really exciting new products. I mentioned that we do savings and taxes. We do retirement. We do health insurance. There is one unifying product that links all those things together. And so there's going to be an HSA 
coming soon in the future. And it's a really, really awesome opportunity for us to deliver value across all of those things in a way that people can then make their health insurance that much more affordable because we're reducing that tax burden. So tons of growth, tons of hiring. We're hiring. We'll leave the link somewhere. <laughs> we're hiring. Uh, we're hiring. Uh, and, and tons of opportunity on like our product roadmap to be able to serve these customers even better. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Thank you again so much, Kristen, for joining us. Thank you for your honesty, your authenticity, and for just sharing with us. Um, yeah, I think the audience is going to love it. You better love it. Um, also, they're hiring. Um, but that is a wrap on this episode of What the Fintech. Thank you also to our listeners for tuning in. If you loved this episode, be sure to hit that subscribe button. You can find me on all your favorite podcast platforms. Until next time, talk to you soon.